said Thursday night, and I want to say to you tonight that today, this, in this teaching, I want to take a look at the image of God that the world has created versus the image of God that we are spiritually being made into. How many know that construction is going on in us spiritually. Even as you sit, I, I hope that the construction is robust. I hope that the, the workers haven't quit and left the job site. Every one of us ought to be actively growing in grace. Construction. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're either growing or we're losing ground. Ephesians 4 and 24 says that you put on the new man, which is after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Then he gives a litany of things to explain what he means. He says in putting on uh, the new man, he says, wherefore, put away lying. Speaking, uh, uh, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Look at his, he says, be angry, be ye angry, but sin not. Know how to hold your anger. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't hold grudges. Neither give place to the devil. Amen. Give no place for the devil uh, to, uh, don't give the devil room to work in your life. Amen. There's any thieves among you, let him that stole steal no more. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed seed out of your mouth. Verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, let all build in bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Clamor is brawling and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. See, notice what he says. He gives a litany of things. We should actively be working toward these things. Because even though every one of us in here who are born again, are born again, are saved, we're yet works in progress. Spiritually, if Jesus came right now, we'd go to heaven. But as we live, every one of us know that there are areas in our lives that the Lord is working on. So we're being made into the image of our Lord. Does that make any sense to you? Colossians chapter 3 and uh, verse 10 says this, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him, that created him. See, we, we grow, we put on the new man. As we learn, we improve. As we learn, as we come into the knowledge, we get better. This is what each Christian must do. This is what we want our children to do. Our sons and daughters with spiritual knowledge and natural, natural knowledge. We, we know, we do what we know to do. And as we learn better, we do better. You don't hold on to that which God says, give up. We're works in progress. We're growing in the things of the Lord. Hopefully. Versus allowing, as I thought, using the metaphor of a construction site, uh, versus allowing the workman to just quit their job and just say, you know, I don't care what the Bible says. It doesn't matter to me, the scripture. I'm just, uh, I'm not for all that. In that case, you're not being created in his image. And the reason he wants to create us in his image is a very important one, is that we are his representatives. 
The God of the Bible, as you know, cannot be seen with the naked eye. And yet the God of the Bible is to be seen. He's to be viewed by his representatives in the earth. Now, as surely as we name the name of Christ, as surely as we've told people on our job, in our community, or wherever we may be, at the gym, or wherever, that we're saved, as, as surely as we've said that the upper room is my church, or Bishop Wooden is my pastor, or I, rep you know, I know the Lord, as, soon, as surely as when getting uh, uh, the uh, application filled out to buy a car or a home or an apartment, you let it slip and you say, praise God. Or you mention that you are a believer at that point to the person that you are talking to, whether they know the Lord or not, you become the Lord's representative. So from that point on, you are obligated to show them Jesus Christ, to show them what a Christian look like. When things go wrong, you're obligated to show them how Christians handle pressure. When things go right, you're obligated to show them how Christians handle success. Praise the Lord. When there's death in the family, you're obligated to show them how Christians handle death. Yes, we're his representatives. In our text, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the birth names Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were God's representatives. And uh, I'm going to preach, but I, but I want to throw this out. Uh, another thing that I want you to consider is, you know, according to the word of the Lord, according to Genesis chapter 1, and you know this, verse 26, the human race is made by God into the image of God. Am I right? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. That is, let us make the human race, mankind there, not anthropos, the male, uh, but well, anthropos, mankind. Let us make mankind in our own image and let us give them uh, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over, the, uh, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Look at this. Male, male and female created he them. Now, we are created in the image of God. The question is, will we human beings who are created in the image of God, will we take God's image, which we are, and then bow to an image that we created. Why would those of us who have been created in the image of God bow to an image of our own creation? That makes no sense. Because anything that we create is beneath us. Any computer, man can never make a computer that can outthink him. So, well, it can add faster than we can, but you can turn it off. Pull the plug and it can't do anything. Why submit to that which is beneath you? This is part of what the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was asked to do. All right? To uh, submit to an image that we're told multiple times in the text that a man set up. 
So that tells you right there, the image is not worth me bowing to because another man set it up. Are you with me? Now, we talked about this, and I'm going to move forward. The reason I use the word compromise, because you know in holiness, the word compromise is a dirty word. We're quick to say that we don't believe in compromising. But the truth is, you can't live in this world without compromising to some degree. Oh, yes, you have to compromise. Paul says that we're not to eat uh, with the fornicators of this world. He says, but the only way to get away from them altogether, you got to leave the world. So if you decide that you're not going to eat in any restaurant where there are fornicators, then you better eat at home. And then be careful who you have over. Well, I don't, I don't eat in any restaurant why they sell, serve alcoholic beverages. But I saw you at the Cheesecake Factory. They have a bar in there. You can't go to a steakhouse. Oh, yeah. See, there is, there is a degree, whether we know it or not. There's a degree uh, uh, to which we all must compromise. I don't have anything to do with uh, homosexuals or anything like that. Perhaps you don't as far as you know. But your doctor may be one. Your mechanic may be. In the interest of compromise, Paul says, if they take food and put the food before you, eat it. But if they tell you that it's been sacrificed to an idol, don't eat it. Now, what he said was, even if it has been sacrificed to an idol, if you don't know it, eat it. Bless the food and eat the food. But then if they tell you, then that's a different story. Everybody has to, in this world, negotiate in order to live. That's what compromise is. It is a negotiation. If, well, what agreement then have light with darkness? Now, it has some because there's such a thing as twilight. And evening time. 12 o'clock, noon is the brightest hour of the day. Sun is at its highest. Midnight is the darkest. Then you see, if you're up early enough, you see the light began to compromise with the darkness. And then as time goes on, light takes over. And then around 12 hours later, you see the darkness beginning to Tip in. Am I right? In most false doctrines, there's enough truth to tell you a lie. That's the trick of Satan. That's why you have to have discernment. Oh, bless his name. Now listen, listen, let me, I want to show you something. What was that compromise? Because if you're not listening, you think that I'm encouraging compromise. No, I just affirm the compromise that we all do every day. You have to. They don't start the hospital with prayer. Talk to some folk who work in the surgeons in, in the where they uh, perform surgery. Some of the doctors not even say you, you, they got you wide open. Machine breathing for you. Man, that took your heart into his hand, cussing while he's doing, playing rock and roll music. You land there. Gone. 
You come out saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the doctor said, doctor think I did this. But we know it's the Lord. There is, there is a negotiation uh, in this life. Where did the Hebrew boys compromise? They compromised by attending the dedication to the ugly, crude, flimsy, godless, monolith that Nebuchadnezzar set up. They had to attend. They were a part of his cabinet. God elevated them into his cabinet. They got in because he elevated Daniel. And Daniel remembered them. I won't go into it today. But Daniel did something that the astrologers of the Chaldeans could not do. In that he told the king his dream. And gave him the interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel great upon that. And made Daniel rich. And gave Daniel power according to chapter 2. Read it when you get home. And then Daniel, according to chapter 2, verse 48, remembered his companions. And gave a letter of recommendation. And these Jewish men were put into positions that heretofore had been reserved for the Chaldean master race. No Jew, especially a child of the captivity, had ever been elevated to where Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel had been elevated. They were rich. They were powerful, they were young, and they were making the most of this new wicked world that they were living in through no fault of their own, for they had been taken captive. Are you with me? Their homeland had been burned. But yet God showed them how to make the most of the hand that had been dealt to them. This is something that, that African Americans used to understand until liberalism and, and victim, vic, victimhood and all these other things have taken over and have caused us to forget how blessed we are. I reminded them at the debate on the college campus of just how far we've come and how blessed we are. I said to the theologians, brethren, have you not noticed that we're sitting here in this beautiful church, in this beautiful arena, and there are people gathered to hear what we think, both white and black. Everybody on this stage is black. There are white seminary students, white people from all over who have come to hear, knowing before they came, hear black folk discuss and debate various matters of scripture. And yet you say, we haven't gotten anywhere. That says, progress has been made. You better learn to celebrate the progress. Amen. These these Jews had been elevated. And, uh, and they knew before they went that they were going to a dedicatorial service. That this uh, king, Nebuchadnezzar, had set up in Dura. And so they went. They compromised. They could have chosen to stay home. They would have gotten in trouble. Um, they went. So the question becomes, how far is too far? The text reveals to us that they did not go 
too far. Their response tells me that even though they compromised and went, they did not allow themselves to become compromised. For when it was time to defend the faith, they stood. Can I get a witness? Nebuchadnezzar built an image. It's amazing what we're told about this image and what we're not, not told. We're given some description of its dimensions. It was 90 feet tall, 60 cubits. The cubits is the length between the elbow of the male and the middle finger. 60 cubits, roughly 90 feet. 90 feet tall and... Uh, nine feet wide, so that tells you right there that it had to be a, a flimsy thing to behold because anything that's 90 feet tall need to be wider than nine feet to, 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 to look right. And the purpose of building the thing was, was uh, the way it was built tells you that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was rebelling against the vision that Daniel had in chapter 2. And, and, and yes, in chapter 2, because when Daniel saw, uh, revealed the vision, he told him that the head was made of gold, but that the feet were made of clay and other earthenware, and said the vision you saw was yourself, and said the Lord is going to give you rain, but there will come other kingdoms after you. Well, what the king decided to do uh, in terms of dealing with the vision he says, no, I'm going to erect a statue and my statue will be all gold, which symbolized my kingdom and my reign will last forever. He was a, what is called a megalomaniac. He had megalomania. He, he suffered from unreasonable, uh, an unreasonably high opinion of himself. He had uh, visions of grandeur. He thought, he really thought that he was, that he was God. He really thought that, that, that there could come no kingdom greater than his. And it's bad when you have a man like that, and then he's, he's, he's ruling over a, a totalitarian form of government where he is the law. He's in charge. This dictator is running the show. He builds an image, and we're not told whether the image was that of Nebo, the God of the Chaldeans, or whether the image was of himself. I think that the reason that we're not told uh, what uh, very much about this extraordinarily lanky monolith that was built is because it really is irrelevant, because it's not worthy of worship. Whatever man builds is not worthy of worship. Only the God of the Bible is worthy of worship. He brought those guys out. He dedicated the temple, dedicated the, the statue, and they went. But then, as we said Thursday night, it took a religious tone, turn. According to verse 4, a preacher came out and preached and said, praise the Lord, that when you hear the sound of the orchestra prep playing, everybody is to bow to this image that not that God set up, but that the king made. Are you with me? So the music played. Verse 8 says, that's what I'm going to start today, wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans, follow me now. Certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. What does this tell you? It tells you that the music had played. And people, everybody there, bowed. Except certain Jews. And you can tell by the way the text gives it, that it was, they didn't make noise, they didn't scream, they didn't holler. They just didn't bow. They stood. So we don't, we don't bow to anybody but to Yahweh. 
You don't bow to this ugly, crude thing. And uh, yes, we've been elevated. Yes, the money is good. Yes, we have a good life. Man, we, you know, we're doing better in the land of our, in the land of captivity than many of our fathers did in Jerusalem. But we're not for sale. We're in the administration. We're loyal to the king. We're doing our jobs. We're no trouble to him. We're not fighting against him. But we can't do this. See, so that tells me that even though they compromised by going to the dedication, their being there did not compromise. It didn't weaken, nor did it spiritually disqualify them. They knew how to negotiate. They knew how far to go and how far not to go. Are you with me? Now, listen, listen to this. Xenophobia showed up. And we've heard that word used quite a bit. Uh, and most of the time it's been misapplied. I don't think a person is xenophobic simply because they believe that we should have strong borders. It's not a hatred of people. Xenophobia is the hatred of strangers. Amen. Uh, 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 the, 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 you, you hate people who are not like you. But in our text, the text implies true xenophobia. For the text says, verse 8, wherefore, wherefore at that time, after the music had played, certain Chaldeans, Chaldeans are dealing with these ethnics of Babylon, uh, certain men of the Chaldeans came near, all right? And uh, uh, these, these men, you're going to see something uh, in just a moment. So they came near and they accused the Jews. Certain men of the Chaldeans, they accused the Jews. The word accused that literally means they denounced the Jews. The word denounced there uh, literally means to eat a piece of. If we, if we use our language, they ripped them to shreds. Certain of the Chaldeans went to the king and they just tore into three. Notice they didn't talk, they didn't tear into three men. They accused, notice how it's written, not three men, not three people, not three members of the administration but three Jews. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.